Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivano L'asok B'edivrei Torah. Blessed you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in words of Torah. <clears throat> All right, so here we are, chapter 19 and 20, and this is uh, the oracle or the burden against against Egypt, and we're just pretty much right smack in the middle of, uh, of this section here, the burdens, and then, of course, the next next week i'm going to try to get through three chapters because they're 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 kind of a unit and so i'd like to get through uh three of them there is just right about uh this area here uh 7 11 sargon attacks ashdod and then he returns to assyria um and so i've moved the the goal post again uh down to just about this point <clears throat> and i think you can see how we're we're getting on on through the through the time frame there okay of course this this only talks about when isaiah was um <clears throat> making his prediction it doesn't uh this line here does not portray when the prediction or the prophecy comes tr becomes true, because uh, a lot of it is going to be, um, of course, when the Messiah comes, or later on, then when the Messiah returns in the in the messianic age. So <clears throat> here we are. This this um, and here we are down here. This uh, this uh, burden or this proclamation. Uh, oracle against egypt down here and uh, then like i said we will try to get this whole whole column that may be that may be too uh <clears throat> too uh, ambitious next week we will try to get through this um 21 22 and 23 um, <clears throat> so um anyway that's where we are and uh this pronouncement that we're talking about tonight um, will clarify God's uh, purposes for Egypt. Uh, that uh, this is another nation that the the um, Israelites wanted to uh, wanted to make an alliance with them because they could see that their real enemy was was Assyria, and so <clears throat> uh, this is once. Once Assyria beat um, Israel and captured uh, Samaria, then <clears throat> Judah could figure out, whoa, no, we uh, we need to get some uh, some allies, and so they were looking at possibly Egypt, and and Egypt had been kind of you know egging on the uh, the neighbors to the north there to yeah go into battle against Assyria and we'll come help. And so they were still negotiating at that point with um, with Egypt, and so this two these two chapters then are again one of those uh, chiastic structures that we talk about, uh, where you got part A is Egypt uh, is going to be smitten by God, and that's in uh, the first fifteen verses of chapter 19 and then you have uh egypt's healing by god and that's in verses 16 to 25 throughout the that's the the second part of chapter 19 and then you come back and uh <clears throat> again with egypt smiting by god uh, or being judged by god again and that's uh, all of chapter all five verses of chapter five uh, chapter 20 so um Assyria had defeated and swallowed up um Syria. Assyria had beaten Syria in uh <clears throat> Damascus fell in 732 BCE and then 10 years later Israel was overrun and Samaria the capital of Israel the northern 10 tribes 
that was also beaten and uh, and destroyed, well, defeated in uh, 722 BCE. And so uh, at that point, then the Judeans are looking south because there's nobody north to help them because they're all defeated. And uh, <clears throat> Isaiah warned his countrymen against relying on Egypt. You know, they could not be trusted. And uh, no one was to be trusted. Uh, Judah should not have tried to ally themselves with anyone. They should have put all their trust in God and not some foreign power. So whenever you put your trust in people, then eventually you're going to be disappointed. God never disappoints, and people seem like they always do. So the um, uh, prediction of Egypt's coming disaster uh, begins and, and ends with references to uh, to God's action. And uh, so in between there, um, Isaiah announced Egypt's social, economic, and political collapse, all, all three of those. And so the whole thing, the whole point of it is that God ultimately controls the fate of nations and all of their social, economic, and political conditions do not. Only God controls the nations. And in that, he actually does control their social, economic, and political conditions. It's not the other way around. So <clears throat> let's go ahead with uh, verse one. The burden of Egypt. Behold, Adonai rides upon a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. Egypt's idols tremble before him, and Egypt's heart melts within them. All right, so this uh, starts out with that word burden, and uh, we've uh, we've seen that one before. That um, it means an oracle or a prophecy or a prediction, and so, so that it God was going. He was just about to visit Egypt, and when he did, all of their idols would prove to be impotent, obviously, because they can't do anything, and the people would be fearful because their idols couldn't do anything. Now, if you remember, this was, this, this happened, um, or this was going to happen around this, you know, 7, 7 11 um, time frame, uh, right at the, you know, at the uh, beginning, you know, at the end of that uh, uh, eighth century, and <clears throat> so, uh, if you remember, then the exodus occurred back in uh, roughly 1447. So um, this was, we're, we're talking about seven or 800 years later that um, God is now going back to Egypt and, and uh, uh, destroying their, their idols or the, at least their dependence on idols. And uh, it, this was a repeat lesson. This was a uh you know the the plagues kind of like the plagues and and other things that um that God had done for Israel on behalf on behalf of Israel done that to e uh, to Egypt back in uh, 1447 BCE then um uh, <clears throat> this is the second time around but the 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 occurrences are going to be different it's going to be a different kind of smiting than what God did uh, before, uh, and, but it's going to also center, begin around the River Nile. So, um, looking at uh, verse two says, uh, I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Everyone will fight against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The spirit of Egypt will drain within it, and I will confuse its counsel, so they will resort to idols, charmers, mediums, and familiar spirits. I will give the Egyptians into the hand of a cruel master and a fierce king who will uh, a fierce king will rule over them. It is a declaration of Adonai. Well, now um Egyptian society egyptian history was well it was well known it was notable for its lack of unity 
throughout its history. I mean, the you know the <clears throat> different pharaohs and the and the the dynasties were as different as night and day. You know, when when Israel was uh, in Egypt, you know, the, you had the Hyksos uh, pharaohs. They were the shepherd kings, and then after Israel left, then uh, they had an, another, the Ramesses, and and that and that group, and then. <clears throat> You know, it it shifted back. Now, now when when um, uh, Isaiah is writing here, the um, it's an Ethiopian faction who are the rulers in uh, in Egypt, and so there's always a lot of of uh, conflict between the upper and the lower Egyptian uh, geographic areas. And so, um, when they had a when they had a pharaoh ruling, he was worshipped as a god, and um, there were uh, quite a few long periods when uh, the 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 forty two city states of of uh, Egypt pretty much ruled themselves. You know, there was really no strong ruler uh, in in Egypt at, at certain times. And so, there, therefore, the, the city-states would rule themselves, and uh, then, uh, of course, then they would have just innumerable um, deities that they would worship. It was just, uh, you couldn't even keep up with all of the different uh, deities that they had. So, <clears throat> when, when Egypt's king was strong, and the people, you know, then the people would... Uh, unite behind if you had a good strong king or even if he wasn't good if he was strong they would unite behind him either voluntarily or involuntarily but when he was weak obviously there was going to be little little social unity or solidarity they were just every man for himself kind of a thing so isaiah he foresaw that he he uh he could see in the end of that that God had given him a vision of all of this, that there was going to be another period of social chaos coming to Egypt when the the, Egypt, the Egyptians would look to idols and the spirit world for guidance. But um, God, you know, the, the, the sovereign uh, Adonai Svaot, as we say in Hebrew, he would uh, then deliver them over to a strong but cruel leader who would uh, dominate them. Now, uh, <clears throat> there's there's several schools of thought as to uh, who this uh, would have been. Some say that it was uh, the uh, Ethiopian pharaoh, uh, Pianchi, and that was around 715 BC. And then there was uh, later an Egyptian pharaoh, uh, uh, Sametichus, and he was around seven uh, six seventy BCE, and but then uh, they they say, well, it could have been one of the Assyrian kings like Sargon II or Sennacherib or Esarhaddon, um, or you know any number. There there's several of them that they just keep going on down the line, even to the point of the Persian king Artaxerxes the the, the third, and that was that would have been all the way down into three forty three BC. So we we really don't know. <clears throat> there, uh, um, a lot of the more conservative scholars they prefer the uh, the idea of Esar Hayden, and that would have been in six seventy one B C E. So for all of those of you that don't care for history, that just went whoosh, right by you. But uh, anyway, uh, bottom line is depressed people many times are easy targets for despotic rulers. They want you know they they're not happy with things the way they are, but just if anybody can fix it, they're for it. And so you know you see the the rise of that kind of those kind of people all through, even in modern history. You know with the with the Bolshevik Revolution, and then of course the rise of Hitler and Nazism during uh, post World War One Germany, and um, you know there's there's many other examples that we could come up with. So uh, anyway. Verse, uh, verses 5 to 10. The waters from the sea will dry up and the river will be drained dry. 
then the channels will stink, the streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up, reeds and rushes will rot, the bulrushes by the Nile, by the mouth of the Nile, and everything sown by the Nile will wither, blow away, and be no more. Then the fishermen will lament, all who cast hooks in the Nile will mourn, and those who spread nets on the waters will languish. Moreover, the workers of fine flax and the weavers of white cloth will be ashamed. Her pillars will be crushed. All hired workers will be grieved in soul. Okay, now, I just wanted to take some, uh, show you some pictures of the idea of uh, the, the magnitude of the Nile and how important it was to the ancient world. And you can see that, you know, it, it starts, uh, well, the, the, the Nile starts uh, way down here in um, this area. Lake Victoria is where it actually starts. And then it flows from uh, south to north. And... Uh, <clears throat> It, uh, you know, and, th and then all throughout the Sudan and this area here, you see a lot of um, canals and tributaries and so forth. So that allows this area to actually be productive. Once it gets up to uh, Egypt, it kind of uh, tapers down a little bit because of the geography. And uh, <clears throat> then... Um, this is more uh, of a modern map than obviously because they've got countries like Kenya and Uganda and, uh, and uh, Rwanda, Burundi, all of those modern, modern uh, countries. But um, the, um, this map over here on the right hand is more of a... Uh, map of the time frame that we're going to be talking about and with some of the names and uh, that uh, we'll be talking about tonight and you can see it's it's much more restricted right down to to you know the areas right around the Nile and of course you get down in this part down here with the uh, the delta that of course that was called the land of Goshen and that's where Israel, um, that's where Israel, the the Israelites, the Hebrews lived during their their four hundred years in Egypt. They lived in this area uh, down here. All right, and uh, going ahead, uh, the, how did they irrigate? I just I don't know if any of you knew this kind of stuff, but uh, uh, it's. Uh, it was kind of a tough way to to irrigate because they would have to dip the water down, dip their their bucket down into the Nile, and then pick it up. And as as the thing rose up, then uh, they would pour the water into a trough or into a uh, a ditch, and then they uh, could uh, you know irrigate. And that was that was a very long hard not really very efficient way to do it but that's all the technology that they had back in those days that method is it was called a shaduf this thing here is called a shaduf all right so now here is a modern picture of the nile as it goes through egypt and you can see that um the the farmland here is only restricted to something that is right around the Nile. Okay, the 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 farmland. You know, this is canals here, and you you can see how that they irrigate, and the land is is pretty much owned in these strips. And you will see this uh, this phenomenon in other parts of the world. If you go for in in modern life, if you go to Louisiana. Uh, along the the waterways in Louisiana, the uh, the bayous and the, like the Atchafalaya and the, and you know to some extent the Mississippi, 
uh, the plantations that we know of that came from uh, you know, Louisiana, uh, <clears throat> many times they were long and narrow with uh, that, you know, it, you didn't have a big wide expanse of river uh, riverfront property. You had a small amount and then your uh, your land just went straight back in uh, in pretty much long strips and you still see this today with uh, a lot of the land are you know uh just uh, strips that run from the the bayou because in that way had more people that had access to the to the uh waterfront which was the only way of transportation uh back in those days so anyway that's i thought that, that was kind of an interesting picture and you look Right here, of course, when they don't have any irrigation, and this is just very sparse irrigation here, but once you get away from that, then what do you got? I mean, it is desert. And uh, I I'd cropped this, uh, blown this picture up a little bit just so that you could get a little bit better view of how the crops were situated. But uh, to the right here, this area here is just, it's just desert for a long, long way. So the river was so important. Uh, Egypt's economy depended almost entirely on the Nile River. And, uh, but God said, okay, the, the Nile is going to dry up. And uh, why is that? Because God said it was going to. It was going to control that somewhere but way back up there in that lake that had yet to be named. But later on, we'd call it Lake Victoria something happened that uh, the uh, the river quit flowing. Maybe there was a, an earthquake or a land uh, yeah, landslide or something that that uh, blocked off the the river and so it didn't flow down river. We don't know uh, what uh, what was going to be the cause. but uh, uh, the, you know the economy would suffer, the people would become weak. And uh, so the point of it was to, uh, it, was, it was pointed at Judah and to show them how foolish it is for them to put their trust in a nation that even though they were strong, they were at the whims of nature, and of course, nature being controlled by God. And so that they should not trust in a nation that could not even control its own destiny, but uh, because God controlled their destiny. He kept trying to push them back, push them to the point that they should uh, be trusting in God. And um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the waters from the sea called, you know, talks about the sea. Well, that referred to the the Nile River. It was so big, so important to them that they they just called it the sea because it ran right on into the Mediterranean. But um, the uh, you know, and it did when it, during their flood stage, you know, it would go way out. the The river would uh, would overflow its banks, and it would be just everywhere. And um, so, yeah, it would kind of look like a like a sea at that point. And uh, <clears throat> then, uh, especially on the lower the lower uh, Nile, which I know it's opposite. You said the lower Nile. Well, that's on the northern end of the of the Nile River, where it flows into the Mediterranean. And so, uh, everything would suffer from that. Just their regular food crops. Uh, their uh, their industry. Uh, Egypt was famous for their production of fine linen. I mean, they they uh, transported that stuff, and that was one of their stocks in trade was fine linen. And in fact, uh, even even today in this world, Egypt produces very fine cotton. It's not linen, but it's cotton, and um, uh, so, but that's what they had back in the, those days. And of course, the, the starting product of, of, uh, of the uh, linen was flax. Okay. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I, uh, 
yeah okay there are there's some flax fields in uh in egypt all right just so that you, you know what that that kind of looks like so you know you can tell if if you didn't have any water in that then you were you were really going to be in trouble because that that stuff just has to have a lot of water it's one of those kind of plants that that uh, you can't you can't dry land farm flax um you know in <laughs> it would not grow in west texas just let me tell you that okay because there's i don't think there's a lot uh, enough water in uh, all the the aquifers up there to have enough water to grow flax in west texas all right so and they and they call about that they they talk he says her pillars will be crushed and that's what they're talking uh, the uh, what isaiah is talking about here is the the things that hold up the egyptian economy and their egyptian way of life is and all of that will be crushed and then the the workers will be grieved in their soul and and so it's kind of like i don't know if you have you know if you can remember seeing and I, and I just happened to think about it or i would have uh, gotten some pictures but um famous pictures from our own uh great depression days where you they uh photographers would show people and they were out of work and they didn't have a place to live they lived you know in in shanties or in the, under a tent or something like that and you could just see the the um uh just the lost um capacity or the the lost look in their in their eyes that you know all hope was gone they had no no hope and so this is what isaiah is predicting for for egypt um and so uh you know when a nation's spirit evaporates and uh, the then then what happens is you have the sectional interest predominate you know that it's um the north against the south or the east against the west or the mountains against the plains wherever the the regional areas are going to start conflicting against uh, each other and um then um you know the the materials may be there the the raw materials but without that river they had no way of uh exploiting what resources that they did have all right so um any comments or questions before we go on <clears throat> all right the princes of zoan are utter fools pharaoh's wisest counselors are stupid how can you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, a son of ancient kings? Where then are your wise men? Let them tell you now. Let them know what Adonai Svaot has purposed against Egypt. The princes of Zoan are fools. The princes of Noph are deceived. The cornerstone of her tribes have led Egypt astray. Now, who are we talking about here? The Egyptians were um well here let me let me go ahead and show you where, where we're talking about the the areas here zoan is here and um it's um and then down here we had zoan is uh, the modern name for it is uh, tanis okay and down here we have uh um Nof. well its modern name is memphis okay and so basically, you know, the, the vast, well, I'd say the majority of the population lived in this area here. So the, the concept is, or the, the idea is that Isaiah is bringing here is just from the north to the south, um, you know, where are all of your wise people? And these, uh, these guys, they prided themselves in their great wisdom and uh you know that's that's long been th been uh there in egypt you know that the great uh library at alexandria had uh, housed the the great wisdom of the ancient world at one point and so um you know 
Isaiah challenged all their wise men to, to go out and tell the people, yeah, what's going to happen? You're so wise, uh, and you're not even telling them that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is coming, and it's not going to be pretty. And God could uh, frustrate their plans, but they couldn't even discover what it was. And uh, they they had no clue, but Isaiah knew, and he's telling them, and these guys, you know, they didn't see it in their wisdom. The, the um, unwise politicians had the, uh, misled the people by by uh, failing to diversify their economy, you know, among, among other things, you know, and uh, uh, too much of their hope arrested in the Nile. You know, they had to have that Nile. And, you know, the people actually worshiped the Nile as a god. It was something that had taken on the idea of a, of a deity to them. Um, Zoan was a chief city and was uh, often the the capital then of Lower Egypt. And then Noth was um, uh, another chief city, Memphis, and it was uh, the, uh, the former capital of the northern part of, of Egypt. So um, let's go on if there's no no comments or questions there. Adonai has mixed within her a spirit of dizziness. They make Egypt stagger in every work as a drunkard staggers in his vomit. Ooh, the gross. There will be no work for Egypt to do for head or tail, palm branch or rush. Okay. Though the wise men of Egypt could not reveal God's actions, the prophet of God, Isaiah, could, and he did. And the the Lord confounded the wisdom of the Egyptians. You know, they were a spirit of dizziness. Um, and um, because they had resorted to idols and spirits rather than seeking God, uh, their, their whole national behavior then resembled that of a of a drunken man they just had no direction and no stability and and they didn't know where to turn they uh they they just made a mess of everything and they would as the as the unfolding disaster um as the disaster unfolded there so um you know a person like that a drunk you know that can't even stand up can't really accomplish much, uh, anything productive, and neither would Egypt. So, the, uh, again, the point being how foolish Judah would be to trust in such a disabled drunk of a nation. And so, um, to join with Egypt then would to be associated with a nation that's under divine wrath. It's under judgment. And uh, you, number one, you're going to trust in the promises of a divided people. They can't decide in themselves how to govern themselves, much less how to go to war. Um, and here they're going to look for some nation that their economy is collapsing. Well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. And uh, they expect wisdom from these wise men that uh, they they're dizzy. They can't figure out uh, anything. And so these people could not, uh, they could not solve their own problems, much less the problems of the nation of Judah. They, they could not do anything for Judah, but, um, uh, and Isaiah was trying to get this point across to, to, uh, Jerusalem that, uh, do not trust in the Egyptians. It will only fail. So, in that day, Egypt will be like women trembling, whoops, women, uh, women trembling with fear because of the shaking hand of Adonai Svaot, which he is about to wave over it. The land of Judah will terrify Egypt. Anyone who mentions it will be afraid because of what Adonai Svaot will, uh, has surely 
purposed against it. So this following section that we're going to look at, in fact, from, from here to the, to the end of the chapter and verse 25, gives the, the Lord's solution point by point uh, to, to the problems of Egypt. And, uh, and for actually, and for that matter, all the powers and the people that leave God out of their equation. The repetition of on that day, you see it in 16, 18, 19, 23, and 24 verses. Um, it, it highlights a time that's yet future, it's coming, when God will reverse Egypt's fortunes, sometimes for the worse, sometimes for the better. And Isaiah used this phrase on that day 42 times throughout his uh, his book, the, the book of Isaiah. And uh, half, uh, you know, I think this is about half of the of all of the other times that's used in uh, by all of the other prophets, you know, when the pro the, the prophets would have uh, their prophecies, and they would say on that day, well, guess what? Isaiah used it 42 times, and so the other 40 times were all the other prophets that uh, that Israel and Judah had. So, and uh, it's also about one fourth that phrase on that day, one fourth of uh, the the total use in all of the Old Testament. So that's just to say he said it a lot. He used it uh, a lot. Um, so the, uh, uh, that same Lord of hosts or Adonai Svaot would, uh, who would bring the former smiting to, to Egypt is now in these next chapter uh, verses, we see that he would also bring healing. We'll see that in, uh, in verse, uh, 18 in a little bit. So again, why turn to Egypt, um, when you know Egypt is turning against God Himself, so um, and we see that uh, uh, at you know at one point then Judah would be exalted over over Egypt, but that's still that has not happened yet. That's going to be a uh, a millennial time frame probably. All right, so <clears throat> let's look at. Um, you know, he's, I think we're not there. Hang on just a second. In that future day, where it says, in that day, Adonai, Adonai Svaot would exalt Egypt or Judah over Egypt. And so that the Egyptians would fear Israel and the Lord. And, and of course, now this happened 700 years previously at the Exodus, but then it's going to happen again by a manifestation of God's power. Now this has not happened yet. Okay, the the um, um, I think it was the seventy three war uh, where Israel beat Egypt on the battlefield. That's not the same thing. That's not what we're talking about here. So this would uh, this has not yet happened. So this particular prophecy and fulfillment would be it, it's got to be more of an end times thing. Okay. So um, let's see, uh, in that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan, Hebrew, uh, swearing allegiance to Adonai Svaot, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, one of the cities used to be called the city of the sun. Now, in that day, the population of five Egyptian cities would speak Hebrew out of deference to the Jews and commitment to God. Now, five cities out of all of Egypt is not, that's not many. And uh, Isaiah evidently meant that, you know, as, as a minimum five or as, you know, as many as five. And uh, uh, of course, in view of their massive idolatry that was all over the land, um, you know, maybe that was a, uh, that was a lot, and uh, it would it it was significant. So, said so one of these cities would be called the city of destruction, 
and in Hebrew it's Jerez. And um, because, you know, maybe because of the uh, the destruction that God was going to bring to Egypt. Now, um, if you look at the King James Version, they call it um, uh, the, the city of destruction. In the true uh, tree of life version that we use in our in our congregation, it's called the city of the sun, and uh, the you know the Heres uh, Heres uh, uh, city of destruction Heres, or it was Heres with that uh, with the uh, het instead of uh, um, the hay. Uh, if if you if you know anything about Hebrew, the, the two different they look they look very similar, but they're they have a different kind of a sound. It's, uh, it's like uh, you know, what do you say Hanukkah or Chanukah? <laughs> but uh, um, if you read it with the Charis, it would be um, city of the sun. Now there was a city in that time frame called On O N. And in the Greek, what do we call that city today? Heriopolis, which um, uh, was the center of worship of the sun god in Egypt. So what this could do is it could signal an end to idolatry there in that in that part of Egypt or in maybe in all of in all of Egypt. So um all right, in verse 19, it says, in that day, again, in that day, there will be an altar to Adonai in the middle of the land of Egypt and next to the border, a pillar to Adonai. It will be as a sign and a witness to Adonai Svaot in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to Adonai because of oppressors, and he will send them a savior and defender, and he will deliver them. So Adonai will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know Adonai in that day. They will worship with sacrifice and offering. They will vow to Adonai and fulfill it. So Adonai will strike Egypt, striking yet healing, so that they will return to Adonai, and he will respond to them and heal them. All right. So. Um, kind of putting all this in, in context, I guess, uh, Abraham built an altar to express his gratitude and commitment to the Lord. You read that in Genesis 12 and Joshua did the same thing in, in Joshua 22 and 24. And, uh, Jacob erected a pillar, which, uh, you know, when he memorialized, memorialized God's covenant with him. And so, the Egyptians will do these things throughout their land to express those those things on that day. Now, uh, during the um, um, intertestamental period, you know, the 400, the so-called silent years, which was anything but silent, but it was uh, 400 years where there was no, uh, no books of the canon uh, uh, written, but there's a lot of other extra biblical texts and so forth. But during that 400 years, uh, where we have the Maccabean period and all that, uh, there there was an uh, an altar or a yeah, an altar built to Adonai in Egypt, and it was uh, it was actually reported by by um, um, Josephus. And here's, I'm just going to give you a little quote from, from Josephus on that. It says, the son of Onias, the high priest, who was of the same name with his father, who fled to, uh, uh, to King uh, Ptolemy, and uh, who, who was called Philometor or Philometor or how there, you know, I looked it up and there's, there's a lot of uh, different ways to pronounce that. And I don't know, Philometor. Um, lived now in, at Alexandria, as we have said already. When this Onias saw that Judah was oppressed by the Macedonians, that, uh, that's under, um, that would have been under uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, and their kings, 
out of a desire to purchase to himself a memorial and eternal fame, he resolved to send King Ptolemy and Queen Cleopatra to, um, to ask leave of them that he might build a temple in Egypt like to that at Jerusalem and might ordain Levites and priests out of their own stock. The chief reason why he was so desirous to do so was that he relied on the prophet Isaiah, who lived about 600 years before, and foretold that uh, there certainly was to be a temple built to Adonai Almighty, or the Almighty God in Egypt by a man who that was a Jew. For the prophet, then he quotes this, for the prophet Isaiah foretold that there should be an altar in Egypt to the Lord, and many other things uh, did he prophesy relating to that place. And so there's that was the writing of Josephus, all right? And so, um, but actually the, the, the context of this prophecy, it's, uh, it's end times, strictly end times, a scatological uh, prophecy. The, the prophecy has yet to be fulfilled. Um, Onias' act then prefigured what will actually happen in the end times. That was just not enough of a, of a thing that Onias did. So an altar to the Lord has been interpreted by some cults as the pyramids. Well, uh, the pyramids are neither an altar nor a pillar, uh, but they're just a humongous mausoleum for the bearing of kings and queens. Plus, the pyramids had already been uh, built, you know, many, many, many years, millennia, you know, maybe a thousand years before this time frame. So, um, you know, the, the Egyptian, uh, the, uh, the pyramids had already been built by the time the, uh, the Hebrews were in, in uh, Egypt. Uh, yeah, in Egypt. Okay, so the Israelites, uh, during the, the period of the judges, you know, when uh, after the conquest of the land and, and, uh, uh, and uh, Joshua had died out and then he had all of the, the judges there. They, uh, the people, we went through these cycles of, of uh, renewal and then rebellion. And then uh, they would, then they would cry out to the Lord that because God would send an oppressor. Well, then God would send them a deliverer. And uh, so one of their greater, great oppressors of the past, of course, was what? The land of Egypt. So and then God would always send them a, a deliverer, and and you know it it could have been Samson, or it could have been uh, uh, Gideon, or Deborah, or whatever the 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 uh, deliverer would be. And uh, uh, the, when the Egyptians call out to God for help, well, He's not going to send them. And this is going to be in the future, and He's not going to send them a deliverer as such. He's going to send them a savior and a champion. He's going to send them the Messiah. This is all coming in the in the uh, the end times. The Lord revealed himself to the Israelites and brought them into a saving relationship uh, to, you know, through a, you know, a the bitter uh, defeat in the, in the, um, the exodus, okay? And that's where, you know, the Israelites, well, they got an eyeful and they learned that they could trust God there. Well, he's going to do the same with the Egyptians in a future day, and they will respond with appropriate worship. And uh, um, so God is acting kind of like a parent. Sometimes parents will, you know, you'll spank a kid to uh, bring them into line and uh, to uh, educate them a little bit as to the, the um, how their behavior is not, to, uh, not to really a good thing. So yeah, he's going to hurt them, but he will hurt them in order to heal them, and kind of like a surgeon will do. You know, sometimes you you're cut on and it hurts, but the end result is that uh, you have healing. So this whole section is a picture of um, reconciliation, but it's still in the future. It's not; it hasn't happened yet. So um, at that point in time, though, 
the the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true God, in Egypt will be open and official. And so we know today that it's not. You know that uh, the Coptic uh, Christians in in um, in Egypt are persecuted, and Jews are just almost non-existent. So, um, and so it, eventually, Egypt will worship God and offer sac uh, sacrifices. And uh, he will punish them, but with the goal of salvation. All right. So um, going ahead, finish the, the chapter. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come to Egypt, and the Egyptians to, to uh, Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, blessing in the midst of the earth, for Adonai Svaot has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. So, the, the human reconciliation, I guess, of the, of the two powers, the northern power and the and the southern power, those are the greatest powers at the earth at that time, um, that will kind of, that's going to, what's going to characterize that day that uh, Isaiah is talking about, and uh, um, there's going to be a spread of peace from a, you know, few cities to a whole country, and now it's going to be to the whole world, and uh, if you study history, you'll know that Israel was always caught between the northern uh, empires and the southern empires because they would use that that road as a um, um, you know they they would use Israel as their road, and uh, so Israel was always being conquered by the one or the other, and they never had a whole lot of peace. But uh, um, in the future. These enemies are going to join together in worship, and not warfare, but in worship, and they will uh, be worshiping God, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel's God. Now, the, um, the there there will be a, a highway, and uh, there was a there was a major highway that to, that uh, uh, existed in. Isaiah's day, but it was what? It was an, a highway for armies to march up and down it and not worshipers of Adonai. So I think we can we can say that, you know, this highway indicates free and easy access and that uh, this is a metaphor or a picture that at one point, I mean, at, at some point in the future, then that um, God is expanding his salvation from just Israel to a few cities in, in Egypt and then expanding to, to Egypt and then on further north. And so eventually it's going to encompass the entire world. Now that part of it we've already seen in the, the, um, the life and the sacrificial death of, of Yeshua. And then later on, you know, after after he's uh, ascended, fifteen years later, uh, then the Holy Spirit is given to what the Gentiles, and so now we see the that salvation is open to anyone in the world, not just the Jewish people, and so that uh, that's actually this this chapter is uh, um, is messianic in that in that regard. All right, so. Now let's go ahead in this other one real quickly, and um, the the following incident here illustrates that the world powers of Israel's day, of Isaiah's day were indeed subject to Adonai, just as the prophet had proclaimed. Okay, it's just another sign. It's the third one so far in in uh, Isaiah that God would and could do all these things in a distant future that Isaiah had predicted. And so um, it also involved a symbolic act. Let's look at it. 
in that in the year that the tartan came to uh ashdod when sargon the king of assyria sent him and he fought against ashdod and captured it that time i adonai spoke to uh isaiah the son of amos saying go remove the sackcloth from your loins and your sandals from your feet so he did so walking naked and barefoot all right the year that we're talking about here is 711 and that's when uh, Sargon came down or his his armies came down and uh basically destroyed or defeated the um the people of of Ashdod because the Palestinians the, the Philistine area there in Gaza had for a long time had had just tried to agitate other people to to go against uh Assyria and so they're kind of a thorn in Assyria's side so they finally uh came down there and and uh, uh Ashdod of course is about 35 miles west of Jerusalem and they had rebelled and Assyria had replaced their king with another guy and uh, uh named uh, Yamani or Jaman and so but the revolution continued and so um um the people of Ashdod sent out to pleas for help to Judah, Moab, Edom, and so Sargon the second, yeah, he responded to that all right, and he sent uh, his second in command down there, and and he defeated him. In fact, uh, the Egyptians, I mean, um, Yamani had uh, fled to the Egyptians. Well, the Egyptians turned him over uh, in chains. They locked him up and turned him over to the Assyrians because they were trying to avoid an attack by the Assyrians. So um anyway, they they got this uh this little bit here that uh, you you know I don't know that there's a great deal of discussion that needs to go on, but said that uh God told Isaiah to uh take take his clothes off, including his shoes, and uh, the the um the word naked in Hebrew Arom can mean clothed with only a loincloth or totally naked, either one. It's used, you know, the, the totally naked uh, word uh, is used in Genesis to describe Adam and Eve. So uh, as it turns out, I, I tried to figure out, I tried to read through this and see, okay, what do all of the, uh, the uh, scholars say? And uh, almost all of the scholars cannot look at the Bible in this instance and um, take it literally. In fact, several of them said, oh, well, you just can't take this literally. No, this is not what God really meant, or this is not what the, you know, it, what it really means, because our God would never have somebody walk around naked to prove a point. And so, uh, it goes on to to say that, okay, well, some people said, well, going around naked just meant that he took off his his prophet's cloak and just dressed like a regular man. And then others said, well, no, he uh, he took off a sackcloth uh, belt that he had on, and that's uh, that's where he said that he was naked. And so forth. so I have a it's just, it, it's just kind of funny to me how that so many of the uh, you know people that that should know better on this kind of stuff they cannot uh, take something as being literally literal if it conflicts with their own preconceived notion and so I don't have a you know. I, I don't care whether Isaiah was uh, naked or not, but uh, let's go on and we'll finish this off. And I'll, I'll, okay, these these two verses here. Uh, and the Lord said, "Like as my servant Isaiah walked around naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners and the Ethiopian captives, young and old, naked and barefoot." even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Now, uh, to me, uh, if, uh, if Isaiah was only, had only taken off his preacher's cloak 
and there, therefore he was naked, or he took off a sackcloth belt, and therefore he was naked, then how in the world was his butt showing? And uh, that's, you know, that's where God is saying right here that just like Isaiah was walking around for three years with his hindquarters shining, the same thing is going to happen to the Egyptians and the and the Ethiopians. So, um, you know, it, it's just, um, and, and in fact, Assyria did come down, defeated Egypt, and hauled off a whole bunch of uh, prisoners and literally hauled them off naked. Uh, just as a as a shame and as uh, a way of just uh, totally uh, crushing them, and so um, I don't know. It's it's not so, some maybe somebody has some real strong feelings about it. I don't have any strong feelings over it, other than the, to say that you know when the Bible says something, um, first of all, you just have to take it literally, unless it's obviously. Um, obviously a uh, a metaphor for something and this i don't look at it as a metaphor it just it says god said do it isaiah did it and then the then later he says and just like isaiah was naked with his uh, rear end showing uh, so these prisoners are going to be taken that way so uh, finishing this off because we're at the end here so they will be dismayed and ashamed because they had hoped in egypt uh, ethiopia and boasted in egypt then the inhabitants of the coastland will say in that in that day, look, such is our hope. There we fled for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria. Now, how we will escape? How will we escape? So Isaiah, um, he, he predicted the, the quandary that the pro-Egyptian faction in Egypt was, uh, you know, what, what are they going to say now when Assyria came down defeated Egypt and the Ethiopians and haul them back through Israel. I mean, when they hauled these tri these prisoners back, uh, it wasn't, they didn't, they didn't take uh, a sea cruise or they didn't go around the other way, to, uh, you know, to east of, of Israel. No, the only way that they could do that and still have water and everything for their own troops was go right smack dab through the middle of Israel along the coast and then up to the Euphrates and on down. And so uh, Israel was certainly able to see that Isaiah had predicted this, and now here they are with a bunch of naked prisoners going right smack dab through the middle of, of, uh, of Israel. And so now they're, they're looking at that and say, okay, we were going to trust in these guys, and now what do we do? We, where are we going to turn? What should we do? Well, you know, the obvious thing is that they should have turned to the Lord to begin with. And that's, that was their only hope. Um, and they should turn to the Lord. And with that, I'm going to close it off for tonight. And that's 